welcome back to Combat Mission, where we're going to take a look at the iconic German half-track of World War II, the Sonderkraft Fahrzeug 251. A little bit of its history, its characteristics in Combat Mission, a shed load of variants, and how to get the most out of them in-game. Infantry carrying half-tracks were a natural reaction to one of the fundamental problems of mechanised warfare in the mid to late 1930s. Namely that tanks and infantry needed to work together, but travelled at different speeds. Infantry on foot could not move as fast as tanks, infantry in trucks could keep up if they had good roads to follow, but that was hardly tactically satisfactory. Fully tracked infantry carrying vehicles were too expensive to make in useful numbers, so the natural alternative was the half-tracked truck. Or, in the case of the 251, the Schutzenpanzerwagen, or SBW, an armoured infantry vehicle. There are a few similarities between the 251 and the American M3 half-track that we've looked at already. They were originally both based on artillery tractors, their main function was battle taxi, and they quickly had everything under the sun bolted onto them. But there are some significant differences. Firstly, the 251's design had some much more complicated elements than the M3. The wide tracks and road wheel arrangement provided a lower ground pressure, giving it better off-road performance in poor conditions, but required considerably more maintenance. The armour scheme was also more complex, invoking the use of sloped armour to increase relative armour thickness, and giving the 251 its distinctive look. The downside to angled armour is that it reduces the internal volume of the vehicle, and is more time consuming and costly to make. One of the reasons why the 251's armour scheme gets less complicated as the war goes on and production needed to be sped up. This leads on to the second major difference between the 251 and the M3. The American vehicle was very much a battle taxi, delivering mounted infantry to the battlefield. While the 251 began in this role, but then developed into a kind of proto-infantry fighting vehicle, courtesy of military history visualised videos on the 251, which I'll link in the description, it could potentially function as something like a mobile foxhole. This naturally has its advantages and disadvantages, which we're going to look at in a bit, but the key concept is that the infantry begins to fight from the vehicle instead of dismounting, exploiting its mobility and protection in certain circumstances. The main issue with the 251 was that there were simply never enough of them. Only about 15,250 were built, as compared to the 53,000 American M3s. Despite the propaganda imagery, the German army of World War II was fundamentally non-mechanised, and even non-motorised. Even dedicated units like Panzergrenadiers were unlikely to be fully equipped with 251s, having to pull all of their SPWs into one of their three battalions to get the most out of them. After the war, half-tracks in general fell out of use pretty quickly, replaced with fully tracked armoured personnel carriers and later full-on infantry fighting vehicles. But the image of the 251 conjured up in the propaganda reels, the association of the vehicle with high-tempo German mechanised operations and the sleek profile have made it something of an icon in certain circles. That's a very quick, very shallow overview of the 251. There are more resources out there if you want to know more. Now we're going to take a look at the characteristics of the base model in combat mission, the Sonderkraft Fahrzeug 251-1C, which is the earlier in-game version of the standard SPW or infantry carrier half-track. Mobility is, as always, tough to quantify in a meaningful way. From a standing start, the 251 can do roughly 580 meters in a single turn on a paved road and about 350 off-road on mixed types of grass in a straight line in damp conditions. If the vehicle starts off at full speed, these increase to about 850 and 440 respectively. As always, these are very specific circumstances. If you're planning a battle and you need to know exactly how far your half-tracks can go in a set amount of time, boot up the map in the scenario editor, replicate the conditions, and then test it. One important note though is that the 251 does not turn very well. This is a pretty common half-track problem, but be aware that they have a huge turning circle and lose a lot of speed in their turns. Firepower is comparatively simple. For the 251-1C, it's armed with an MG34 on a central pintle mount behind the cab. This fires 7.92mm AP ammunition from a drum magazine. The in-game model looks to have a 50 round drum, but the gunner definitely fires off 250 rounds before needing to reload. 
Using this, the half track is capable of engaging light vehicles like trucks and jeeps, allied half tracks and some armoured cars like the Soviet BA-64 are likely to suffer spalling and partial penetrations at 500 metres, even from the front, but the gunner won't even bother shooting at light armour like the T-70s unless the crew are opened up. The MG does have a pretty limited traverse to bear in mind, so the half track is going to have to do a lot of the aiming by pointing in the general direction, something that does not mesh well with the full turning ability. Fundamentally, the 251's machine gun is there to assist the infantry it carries, putting down suppressive area fire to allow the Panzer Grenadiers to advance. If it gets the chance to engage enemy infantry in the open, then it's obviously capable of causing casualties, especially at close range. However, the closer the 251 gets, the more vulnerable the gunner will be to incoming fire. The gun shield will protect him from some frontal small arms and machine gun fire at 500 meters, but it's not something you really want to be relying on. There's quite a lot of head that is still exposed. The rest of the 251-1C is fairly well protected against small arms fire. Enemy infantry are somewhat reluctant to even bother opening up outside of close range, and full power rifle rounds are only likely to cause spalling well inside 100 meters against the side or rear arm. A lot of this is thanks to that sloped armor plating, but small arms fire is pretty much the only thing it will protect against. Heavy machine gun fire, any type of anti-tank weapon from Soviet AT rifles to American bazookas and everything nastier will poke holes in the armor all day long. Smaller caliber rounds may not inflict much post-penetration damage. 37mm solid shot and anti-tank rifle rounds, for example, are pretty capable of zipping through one side and out the other with minimal damage unless they hit something important. But if the half-track has any troops inside, they're going to have a bad day. Naturally, being open top, the 251 is also very vulnerable to anything unpleasant that happens to fall in it. Speaking of squishy things inside though, the 251-1C has a crew of two, a driver who sits in the front left of the cab and a gunner who sits behind the MG and stands up to operate it. Sadly, the MG-34 is fixed and can't be dismounted, leaving the gunner armed with only a pistol if he has to go on foot, but the driver does carry an MP-40 submachine gun for personal defence. This leaves 11 passenger slots, one up front in the right of the cab, and then 10 spaces on inward-facing benches in the rear. When full, this makes for a very packed transport. The passengers are behind armour in the frontal arc, providing the MG's gun shield is facing forward, giving them some degree of immunity to small arms fire, but the heads do stick up over the armour when seen from the side and rear, and they can be shot off. Interestingly, the half-track doesn't seem to be treated as a dedicated vehicle. If the crew dismount or become casualties, infantry on board the 251 will take over the driver and gunner positions without much problem. If opened up, the gunner will assume the firing position for the MG, and any passengers may stand up in the back and engage targets over the armour. If the enemy is suitably suppressed or otherwise incapable of shooting back, this can be an effective way to mop up a position without having to waste time dismounting. But accuracy on the move is poor, and in combat mission at least, the shooters are extremely exposed in the process. Passengers exit the vehicle by jumping over the sides or using the rear door, it takes about 7 seconds for 11 passengers to bail out. Getting in is much slower as access is only via the rear doors and can take anything from 50 seconds to a minute as the pixel trip and run around trying to find their seat. In terms of equipment on board, the 251 comes with a radio, allowing the crew and passengers to maintain command and control, as well as plenty of small arms ammunition that can be acquired by the passengers, over a thousand rounds each of 9mm and 7.92 arm piercing. It may also carry a Panzerfaust, which is always worth picking up. Finally, the half-track can be used to tow certain anti-tank or field guns, provided they can be limbered up, and providing there is enough passenger capacity for the crew to actually all fit in. That's a quick overview of the base characteristics of the 251-1C. This is the earlier of two base model 251s in combat mission. The other is the Aus D, which has had a reduction in the number of sloped armour plates to simplify production. The easiest way to tell them apart is by looking at the front. The C has two headlights and the D has one. Or by looking at the rear. The C has a bulging rear door arrangement, while the D has a much simpler single flat armoured plate. Functionally in combat mission, 
The 251-D seems a little more vulnerable to small arms fire at close range than the C, and may start to suffer partial penetrations instead of just spalling, but I don't think it makes much practical difference. Also, not making much of a practical difference, it may come equipped with an MG42 instead of an MG34. This has a higher rate of fire, but fulfills the same role in the same way. That brings us on to the variants. There are 10 of these modelled in combat mission, which are designated by number. So in the force selector they appear as SPW251 slash and a number, then whether it's using the C or D chassis. The standard infantry carrier that we've looked at so far, for example, is the 251 slash 1. The variants we're going to be looking at are the slash 2, 3, 7, 9, 10, 16, 17, 21, and 22. The first variant, the Slash 2, is the mortar carrier variant. This removes the pintle mounted machine gun and inserts the standard German infantry 81mm medium mortar. The mortar can be fired from inside the half track, but it has a limited traverse due to the fixed base plate, so the half track is again going to have to do most of the pointing. The actual half track has a crew of just one, a driver armed with an MP40, while the mortar team consists of four men plus two ammo bearers. The Slash 2 has a reduced passenger capacity of 8, so this leaves two empty seats. The mortar team can jump in and out of the vehicle, taking the mortar with them, so they can be used dismounted as a standard mortar team if needed. Aside from the obvious advantages of mobility and protection, the Slash 2 has two other important attractions. Firstly, it's equipped with a radio, so you don't need to worry about your mortar team losing contact with the platoon HQ if you're dabbling in indirect fire. Secondly, the half-track carries a significant amount of extra ammunition. Dismounted infantry medium mortar teams and their ammo bearers, selected as specialist teams or insan formations, come with a total of 38 mortar bombs, 32 high explosive and 6 smoke. When mounted in a half-track, the mounted mortar team has a stockpile of 101, 90 high explosive and 11 smoke. This does mean that the half-track reacts poorly to penetrating hits, so keeping your spacing is important, and the lack of the pintle mounted MG makes it easily identifiable, but that amount of ammunition in a mortar is absolutely worth it. Next up is the Slash 3, the command half-track, otherwise known as the Commando Panzerwagen, or the Funk Panzerwagen. This also has some reduced passenger capacity, down to 6 this time, with the space being taken up by extra radios. The main benefit in combat mission terms is that the HQ unit inside, these are usually company or battalion commander vehicles, can maintain C2 whilst on the move, something they can't do on foot. The flip side should be pretty obvious, this is still a lightly armed and armoured half-track, except it's pretty clearly marked out as a high priority target by all the radio aerials. Jumping up to the 251-7, we have a Pioneer or Engineer variant, the Pioneer Panzerwagen. Again, this only has space for six passengers, presumably because it's full of engineering equipment, but apart from this the only difference in combat mission is that a pair of infantry assault bridges have been mounted on either side. These don't do anything in-game, they can't be removed or deployed, so their main in-game effect is to let the enemy know where your pioneers are. Next we have the Slash 9, otherwise known as the Stummel. This does away with all the passenger capacity and the machine gun in favour of cramming in a short barrelled 75mm gun. The same short 75 in fact, found on early model Panzer 4s and Stugs and found in game on the Panzer 3N. This is a close support weapon, usually found in Panzer Grenadier heavy platoons and this is reflected in the ammo count. The Stummel carries 42 high explosive rounds and 4 smoke, but only 6 heat rounds. These high explosive anti-tank rounds rely on a shaped charge warhead for armour penetration, so range to the target isn't an issue, and they are capable of partially penetrating the frontal armour of Sherman's or T-34s, though not reliably. That's a brown pants anti-tank capability though. The high explosive round is effective against light targets, buildings and infantry, and boasts a snappy reload time to boot, so it's very effective in its intended role, providing it doesn't get shot at much. The Stummel doesn't have any extra armour, so it's just as vulnerable as the other 251s, and unlike, say, a tank, it doesn't have any machine guns to deal with pop-up infantry threats or to hand out more constant suppression. Finally, 
The 75mm gun and its mount take up a significant amount of room in the front of the half track and limit the traverse, so again, the Summel really needs to be pointing at what you want it to shoot. It has a crew of four, driver in the standard position front left, then the gunner and loader in sequence behind him, and the commander on the right directly behind the gun. After the 251-9 we have the slash 10, which is another support half track. This one replaces the standard machine gun mount with a 37mm Pack 36. Like a lot of the lower calibre early war anti-tank weapons, the Pack 36 was being replaced by higher calibre more powerful weapons by mid-war, but it was small enough to be effectively mounted in the 251 to give Panzer Grenadier platoons some extra punch. They are usually used as platoon leader vehicles. Obsolescence does not make the 37mm gun useless. T-34s are mostly safe thanks to the sloped armour, but Shervans are vulnerable to penetrations from the side and rear at close range. Post-penetration effects can be a little wanting due to the small size of the rounds, but nobody likes holes getting poked in their tanks, and a smaller calibre translates into a high rate of fire, about 8 rounds a minute. Lighter vehicles such as armoured cars and other half-tracks are comparatively easy prey, though against infantry, the 37mm high explosive shells can feel a little anemic, simply because a smaller shell can fit less explosive filler in it. The 251-10 comes with a shed load of ammunition though, 98 rounds of high explosive and 70 rounds of armour piercing. It has a crew of four and two spaces for passengers, which is enough for a Panzer Grenadier Platoon HQ. The variants up to this point have been the more conventional ones. From here on out, things start getting increasingly interesting and, potentially, increasingly questionable. The 251-16 is a flame half-track or Flammenpanzerwagen. The passenger capacity has been replaced with fuel tanks and pressure systems for two flame projectors on either side of the rear compartment. These have a range of about 30 metres. As you might expect, the flamethrower is effective against infantry in the open, dense terrain or buildings, and can be very effective against some vehicles, especially if they're open topped. The downside is that 30 meters is not a long way, and the 16 needs to get dangerously close to anything you want it to burn. Again, the half-track features no extra armor bar gun shields for the flame projectors, so it's just as vulnerable as all the other half-tracks, and is definitely a kind of finisher or mopping up instrument for clearing out enemy infantry that is already heavily suppressed or heavily degraded. Naturally, all the fuel on board is bad news for the crew if the vehicle suffers a penetration. Additionally, the Slash 16 retains the pintle mounted MG, and while this gives it some capability beyond 30 meters, the side-mounted flame projectors have relatively narrow arcs to the size of the vehicle that don't cross over with the MG, so sometimes giving the half-track a target command will see it turn on to engage with the machine gun instead of trying to toast the target. It would seem that the best way to use the flame half-track is in drive-bys, to both minimize close-range exposure to the enemy and give the flame projectors the best angle, but carrying this out in practice is pretty difficult, at least in game. The Slash 16 has a crew of five, the driver and another crewman up in the cab, then operators for each of the three weapons. Next up we have the 251 Slash 17. This is the 251 variant that really looks closest to being a modern infantry fighting vehicle. The machine gun has been replaced by a 20mm cannon, but there are still seven passenger slots, enough for an understrength squad. The 20mm cannon comes with 400 rounds of high explosive and 200 rounds of armor piercing incendiary, and the gunner fires it in rapid bursts. Similar to the 37mm gun, it's not going to punch holes in allied tanks, but it will make a mess of lighter vehicles and infantry, and also functions as an AA weapon. The 20mm can engage incoming enemy aircraft, though it's hard to quantify how effective it is at this. Sticking with the running theme, the 7 team has a limited frontal traverse for the cannon, so once again, the vehicle is going to have to do most of the aiming. It comes with a crew of three, driver, gunner and another crewman, and it usually serves a similar role to the Slash 10 in later war formations, serving as a platoon commander's vehicle with some extra firepower. The 251-21 variant, otherwise known as the drilling or triplets, is what you get when you think one cannon isn't enough. Again, the machine gun has been removed, this time replaced with a triple cannon arrangement that 
really goes some way to spelling out how screwed the Germans are in the later war. The first version is armed with 15mm MG-151 cannons, usually found on board Luftwaffe fighter aircraft, and these have been fixed to a Kriegsmarine pedestal mount from a ship. Things are not going well when two of your services are so depleted and useless that the third is raiding them for parts. As mentioned, there are two versions of the 21. An early version with the aforementioned triple MG-151s, and a late version with triple 20mm cannons. The in-game model looks identical, so you can't tell them apart. The MG-151s come with over a thousand rounds of high explosive incendiary ammo and 500 rounds of AP. The 20mm come with over a thousand rounds of straight armor piercing. Both have a high rate of fire, so they can be a little more effective against allied armor through sheer cumulative subsystem damage, but they're unlikely to score any penetrations. On the plus side, unlike any of the other 251 variants, the cannons do have a 360 degree field of fire. The 251-21 has a crew of four, driver, gunner, commander, and a very busy loader, but no passenger capacity. It is intended to act as an AA vehicle, so it can engage allied aircraft. As usual, the emphasis here is on deterrence rather than actually trying to shoot anything down. Finally, we have the 251-22, which once again removes the MG, and puts in a Pac-40 75mm anti-tank gun. This might seem like a good idea. The long-barreled Pac-40 is a good anti-tank weapon, capable of knocking out most allied tanks, and marrying it to a mobile chassis like the 251 has clear advantages over a stationary position. But it's also worth considering that the 251 and the Pac-40 coexisted inside the German army for most of the war, and one only started getting jammed into the other right at the end. A lot of this is to do with desperation, outweighing the stress effects on the vehicle of extra weight, blast and recoil effects that it really was not designed to worry about, but it's not something we need to be concerned with in combat mission. What we do need to worry about is the familiar limited traverse in the frontal arc, and the low ammunition count. The 2-2 only carries 22 rounds, 13 armor piercing, 8 high explosive and 1 smoke. The gun is good, it's capable of scoring penetrations on the frontal armor of allied mediums like the Sherman T-34 all the way out to 1000 meters, but the limited protection of the half track means that it very much needs to be handled at distance as a shoot and scoot tank destroyer. The Slash 2-2 has a crew of 4, driver and commander up front in the cab, then gunner on the left and loader on the right in the rear compartment. That's all the variants, some of which seem a lot more useful in game than others, how do you make the most out of the 251? How do you handle it in combat mission? And I think the answer is undoubtedly carefully. The point of the 251 is to allow Panzer Grenadiers to keep up with the armor so that the tanks have infantry in close support who can occupy ground that has been taken and clear out dense tank unfriendly terrain. This indicates a role for the half track as a battle taxi. The infantry use it to get around the battlefield at speed with protection from small arms and shrapnel, then dismount to fight. This makes a lot of sense, because the hard tracks are so vulnerable to everything that isn't small arms fire or shrapnel, and because penetrations are likely to cause high casualties among the passengers. So dismounting one terrain feature away, and using the machine guns on the half track to add to the suppression of the enemy position that's being assaulted, looks like a good bet. Fighting mounted from the half track, on the other hand, is not impossible but I think it requires a lot of prerequisites to be a reasonable option. Only exposing the half-tracks once enemy AT assets have been eliminated is a must, staying out of range of enemy infantry handheld anti-tank weapons is another, even keeping the 251s out of effective small arms range is a good idea. This all also necessitates suitable terrain, preferably flat and open. Having something big and nasty around to soak up attention and deal with emerging threats is a good move too. In other words, screening half-track movements or formations with tanks. Staying mounted to bypass enemy positions is much more sensible than trying to actually close assault them, whether staying mounted or dismounted onto them. You may be able to get away with it with a high volume of suppressive fire and loads of smoke or against poor quality troops, but there is a tremendous amount of risk involved. Overall, I think the key thing with the standard 251, the infantry carrier, is not to focus on the vehicle itself. Sure, it, it looks cool, but fundamentally it's an enabler. It's there to get infantry to where they're needed, quickly, without them being tied out, and with some protection against shrapnel and small arms. Once they've dropped the infantry off, they can provide some suppressive fire with their machine guns. When the infantry remount, 
they can restock their small arms ammunition. The variants are also there to support the infantry. I'd say the most useful is undoubtedly the mortar carrier with its high ammo count, but your mileage may vary. There's apparently a lot of love for the Stummel for some reason. But that's it for this video. A quick overview of the Sondercraft Vargasaur 251 and its variants in combat mission. Hope you all enjoyed this and found it useful. I'll catch you in the next video.